good afternoon all um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, dr janlin go um, as uh, today's speaker uh, dr go received his uh, bachelor of engineering and masters in engineering in material science and engineering from shenghua university china and phd from queens university belfast uk he is now currently working as the scientific director of senti software in uk focusing on developing computer software jmat pro which models materials properties and behavior of critical alloy design and processing he has written and co-written more than 100 technical papers including 40 journal papers and one book on managing steels today dr go is going to present his talk on materials modeling towards virtual simulation of metals processing. Uh, the title of my talk today is Materials Modeling Towards True Virtual Simulation of Metal Processing. And uh, the, the work is done by me and our team uh, based in Hillfort, Surrey, which is not far away from uh, University of Warwick. Here are the methods of metal processing. And as you can see, there are some traditional ones like casting, forging, rolling, heat treatment, and welding. And also the most recently popular ones like additive manufacturing or 3D printing. The general way of doing processing simulation is like this. Uh, it typically is done using CE packages, uh, which deal with the geometry of the sample your component, and processing conditions, and you get material data and put everything together into a, a solver of finite nature, either finite element, finite difference, finite volume, or those kind of uh, techniques. And then you get your results. These are the time when you see those pretty pictures. Uh, you usually you don't realize that in this kind of uh, simulation, there are essentially two parts. One is the software side that is dealing with the computation. The other is the material side, that is the library of material data. It is in fact the material data are usually measured through experiments that prevents this simulation from being called virtual simulation or true virtual simulation. If we can somehow develop material models where all the material data or most of the material data can be calculated. Then by linking that kind of uh, materials modeling approach with the CE package, then we are hopefully moving closer to virtual simulation. If you also look at this uh, combination, it is in fact, is trying to merge alloy design with processing design. Because for, histor for historical reasons, alloy design and processing design are two loops. So here we are trying to uh, have alloy design and processing design in the same optimization space or same design space. So there's an evolution in the demand for, for phenomenon coupling in the simulation. By phenomenon coupling, I mean, in the early days, if you can deal with the phenomenon like a heat transfer, that is a temperature field. That would be great because in the early days, the competition power was not that great. But with the advancement in competition power, gradually people can build in more stuff or say considering more phenomena in the simulation like deformation or stress strain field. But whenever you have more phenomena considered, you have to deal with the interactions like uh, you have to uh, the interaction between these different phenomena. If we consider even more, let's say transformation of phase, uh, phase transmission kinetics or say microstructure field, then you will have to, to deal with even more interactions. And also to consider these different types of uh, phenomena in your simulation means you require more and more material data. So that is a demand uh, there's an evolution in the demand for the materials data. Uh, for instance, if you want to deal with heat transfer or casting simulation of that sort, 
then you need lots of physical and thermomechanical properties. And uh, here's a list of some of them I wouldn't repeat, but basically it covers uh, fraction solid, enthalpy, thermoconductivity, and the uh, modulus, positive ratio, those kind of properties. And if you want to consider deformation mechanics that is stress stream field in your simulation, you will have to consider things like uh, you will have to require material data like mechanical properties, that is the high temperature strength and the stress strain curves or flow stress curves. If you want to deal with phase transformations, of course, you have to have more models to deal with things like uh, uh, TTT, which is isothermal, CCT, which is continuous cooling transmission diagram, and the TTA, which is a transmission during a heating process. And you should be able to deal with all these kind of transmissions this kind of thing. And to make things worse, all the material data here, right, they are dependent on lots of other factors. Uh, to name a few from uh, alloy composition, microstructure, temperature, time, cooling rate, heating rate, strain and strain rate, so on and so forth. And uh, if you imagine, if you need this kind of material data for your simulation, you cannot physically possible to measure all those data through experiments, especially for some cases to achieve accurate simulation, you need property per phase. And if you put everything, all these kind of influential factors in, in mind, you will realize that materials modeling is the only way forward. So how to do this materials modeling? There are lots of ways to carry out materials modeling. And uh, the approach that we use is called extended CAFAT approach. CAFAT stands for calculation of phase diagrams. And uh, if you look at the picture here, which basically the thermodynamics part, if you can see, is the CAFAT part. It provides thermodynamic calculations. And, uh, Based on thermodynamic calculations, we further model phase transmission kinetics. At the end of this kind of uh, modeling, we will have the microstructure. And then we further divide microstructure property relationship models. And at the end of the day, we will have obtained many of the properties that is required for CE simulation. So this is a part that we call materials modeling. And if you use another way to generalize this approach, the first step is to get a microstructure. This is a part where uh, CAFAT for thermodynamics and other phase transmission models are kicked in. At the end of this step, what you get is the amount of phases and the condition of those phases. And the second step, is property per phase. That is to calculate the physical, small physical properties or solid solution stress of the relevant phases in the microstructure. And the final step would be put everything together, put the information you got from the first step on phase amount and composition, and the second step on property per phase, you use different modeling techniques. It can be, which can be easily, which can be simply uh, linear or nonlinear friction uh, mixture loss, or it can be mechanism based. Uh, for instance, when you do stress modeling. And uh, let's say alloy chemistry processing, you get microstructure, right? And microstructure typically contains phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on. And the step two calculates property one, property two, and property three. And then you calculate the overall properties. So as you can see naturally, right, the properties are usually provided for each phase. So comfort is very important element in the current or in our modeling approach. So I'm going to quickly explain how comfort works. Uh, similar to processing simulation, comfort also got essentially two elements. One element is the software part, or we say that is a computation platform. The other side of the story is material data. 
but in the context of cloud approach, it is a thermodynamic database. And when you run uh, any uh, thermodynamic calculation of calculator uh, type, you are always dealing with these two parts. So uh, it's very important when you report such kind of calculation, you better highlight these two things in your papers, in your publications. And of course, if you want uh, these, uh, you, are, you have your own interest in a very a specific area when there are no thermodynamic database available, then you can design your own database. And I, that's all I, I want to say about a CalFAD approach, but I'd like to recommend a few things if you are interested in this approach or if you indeed want to design your own database. One is a book written by uh, Saunders and Madonic, two of my colleagues, is on, called CalFAD calculation of phase diagrams. The other is uh, Professor Sir Harry Badisha's website, and he, he got lots of nice, beauty, uh, beautiful teaching materials there, and one of them is on uh, thermodynamic and phase diagrams, and which I watched uh, a few times. And there are, of course, other useful websites that you can look into, uh, like the SDTE website, and also another rather popular one called Open Carfet. From those kind of uh, places, you can uh, get a lot of information. So CalFAT gives what? CalFAT gives this kind of information. One is the amount of phases. The other is the condition of phases. Uh, the left one, that is a different form of phase diagram. Because the no normal phase diagram, like the one where you think are carbon diagrams, that is an isoplast type. But here is a, in a different format that is a uh, amount of phases as a function of temperature for a given or fixed alloy composition. And the composition of each phase, for instance, uh, the, for this uh, titanium C4 alloy here, using the beta phase as an example, it shows its change with the temperature. So if you choose a fixed temperature, let's say 800, you will see the amount of alpha phase and beta phase uh, of this amount, 84 worth and 16% respectively. And the condition of the alpha and phase, of alpha and beta phase also can be provided. And uh, based on such information, let's say if you know the condition of one phase, then we use this approach. That is, uh, depending on how you see it, it can be a rather simple, it can be a rather complex formula to calculate the property of one solution phase as a function of its composition. Where this Xi, Xj, they are the element concentration in that phase. And uh, why I say this is uh, looks simple, but indeed it can be complex because for each property of interest, because there are so many phases involved in this kind of calculation, you may have to develop uh, some database for that. And uh, so such database can be a like molar volume, can be a small conductivity, or Young's modulus, or even solid solution stress, this kind of database. For, for instance, uh, using the Titanic C4 as an example again, and you can calculate the density of the alpha phase of the beta phase and of the liquid phase. Based on this kind of property per phase information, you get the overall properties, which is a kind of a gray line here of the whole temperature range. So these are essentially how the physical or small physical properties uh, listed here can be calculated while this uh, extended CalFAD approach. Unfortunately, not everything can be done this way. For instance, for stress. And here we comes the second part of the materials modeling, that is how to model materials flow. So the stress modeling is, as I said, cannot be a simple linear mixture law anymore. Instead, we use a mechanism-based mechanism approach. That is, we consider solid stress strengthening, and the green size effect, that is a how patch relationship. 
And for systems where precipitation plays a very important role, then we have to consider precipitation hardening. All this kind of thing is already complex enough, right? But this is only part of the story because whatever you do, the strengths calculated here are in fact for a limited temperature range, typically from a room temperature to a intermediate temperature range. When temperature is high into the elevated temperatures, you may have to use a different approach. That is, uh, the strength is not, uh, the strengthening mechanism is not as a uh, room temperature anymore. You have to use creep control strength. That is uh, where I will explain a little bit more later. The real strength of the, uh, of the alloy will be a combination of the two, that is, uh, or the weaker one of the two. That is, uh, uh, keep this in mind because this means you have a kind of a temperature switch. So this kind of switch is not really anything new. I mean, if we look back, look at uh, the very famous deformation mechanism map or Ashby map, and you will realize that this kind of switch is pretty normal. In fact, it's not just one switch. Whenever you see this kind of deformation mechanism map, mind you, here is the stress or normalized stress. Here is temperature or T divided by T melting point. And if you look at this one, whenever you see a boundary, you, that implies a mechanism change, mechanism switch. And uh, the room temperature one, typically it is a dislocation glide, or we, we say dominated by dislocation glide or DGG grid. And uh, this part would be dislocation creep, or we say dominated by dissolution climb or DDC region, because I'm going to use DDG and DDC later on. There are also another switch that is uh, from, that is a change of creep mechanisms, which I'm not going into details now, because this region indeed goes to a region where the stress level is very low and uh, the temperature level is rather high. And uh, when we talk about the strengthening mechanisms, usually we are talking about the deformation via dissolution glide that is in the DDG region. And uh, this kind of switch appears in two places at least. One is, as I explained, that strength is a function of the temperature. You will have a critical temperature there. Below DDG, above DDC region. You will also have this kind of switch in the stress ring curves or flow stress curves. And in this concept, in this context, the transition part is a critical strain, or shall we say a transition strain. And this kind of transition strain is not a constant, as you can imagine. It is a function of temperature and uh, uh, strain rate. Basically it means at different region, different temperature strain rate regime, you uh, transition strain can be of very different value. If the transition strain is rather high in value, then you will observe strain hardening only. That's typically what you do a stress strain curve in this DDG region. One deal, this is a stress as a function of temperature. That's in that region. If you're closer to the transition temperature, you will observe a flow stress curve of this type. String hardened first and then flow soft. If you uh, see flow stress curves in this region, then typically you will observe a curve dominated by, uh, by flow softening only, because this kind of transition string is very small. So this is indeed what we observe in reality. Again, if you use a, a titanium alloy as an example, and you can see that at room temperature, or uh, another at uh, 482 centigrade, you typically only observe string hardening. And if it's a temperature is high and high and high, you will see a transition with a uh, uh, string hardening, flow softening to uh, uh, in the end, you will observe flow softening only. So these are the reality. Also, you, uh, you may not uh, be, uh, realize this. 
So how to model flow stress curves? I mean, before coming into the modeling of the string hardening and the flow softening in the flow stress curves, we just take a step back to see how materials flow can be described. If you think about a stress strain curve uh, in the tensile testing, it's essentially describing stress as a function of strain, strain rate, and temperature. In another form, let's say creep testing, that's another form of materials flow. We are describing strain as a function of temperature, stress, and time. Mind you, between strain, time, and strain rate, there are only two independent variables. So essentially, these two are just different forms of those kind of uh, correlations. And uh, if you think about those four or five variables or four independent variables, if you fix two of them, you can get four variations of materials flow. Let's say if you fix strain and strain rate, we will get the strength versus temperature plot. That is a high temperature strength curve. If we fix temperature and stress, we got creep curve. We, and then fix temperature and strain rate, we got stress strain curve. And if you fix temperature and strain, we got stress relaxation curve. These kind of curves, imagine if you have enough data of one of them, you can get the other three. That is, I will come back to this again. If you have enough data on creep curve, you can get stress strain curve or flow stress curve from that. So now back to flow stress modeling. And uh, we first model the flow stress curve in the DDD region, or say string hardening region or work hardening region. There are lots of formulas which I'm not going to spend too much, too much time on. But essentially, uh, in our modeling, we take this very simple approach to model string hardening. And uh, we have to consider strain rate effect in this DDG regime. This is considered by the so-called strain rate sensitivity, that is the uh, M. And uh, here is how the M is considered in this context. After all of this, what you should know is we can calculate strain strain curve at any strain rate and any temperature for the DDG region. So one thing we are lacking is the flow softening region or DDC region. In this region, we're not so lucky in that sense that not many equations are available to model these kind of flow stress curves. But we do realize that there are lots of efforts on studying the creep behavior. And uh, here comes the trick. Instead of trying to model flow stress curve directly, we model creep curve first. And then after that, we do a simple conversion because that is uh, just a uh, a simple computer program that can easily do the conversion. What is a creep curve? Here is a full creep curve. It's at a fixed temperature and a fixed stress. And uh, you get the full curve. Uh, full curve. This curve uh, consists of three studies. Uh, or if you count this initial strain in that before, otherwise it's just a three studies. Primary creep, secondary creep, and tertiary creep. And uh, looking at the string, uh, the creep rate, then it will be of this form, because it's usually the creep rate that's of utter importance in this uh, kind of contest. So this is a stage where you got the steady state creep rate. And this rate, creep rate can come after different names. It can be a secondary or steady or minimum creep rate. And uh, there are lots of uh, efforts on this kind of modeling. And one simple form or one form for the power law creep is of this form. It considers, uh, mind you, for this kind of uh, creep modeling, you have to have a, a structure in mind. Because here's formula is for FCC phase, that is the alternating steels or gamma in nickel alloys. And uh, uh, SFE here stands for stacking for energies and the other places, other variables are of their euro meanings. Apart from one that I have to introduce, that is a back stress. This is the case 
uh, when you have to consider if you have precipitates in your system. Based on the secondary creep rate, we can derive further equations for primary creep. So this is the equation for primary creep. And uh, we can even further divide another form for tertiary creep. So this tertiary creep is related to second rate and rupture life as this form. And the TR here is a rupture life, which can indeed be linked with the secondary creep rate. So the ability to describe the primary, secondary, or tertiary means you can describe the full creep curve as this is a simple summation of those three. So now we have a full creep curve. Just show you an example of a full creep curve look like. It's probably nothing, nothing unusual for those who know creep. And these are at high stress levels and uh, gradually moving down to low stress levels where we will have a longer creep life. Then comes the tricky part, which I will conveniently skip because, uh, but if you want to know more, I can send you a, a document explaining how this conversion is done. That is converting creep curve, or indeed a set of creep curves to stress strain curve. The essential idea behind this conversion is stress strain curve is at constant rate. That is, you try to get lots of data points by this kind of a manipulation of rates in creep curves. So if you are interested in more details, please let me know. So after this, we got stress strain curve, uh, uh, flow stress curves. So that's what we are trying to achieve. And now we have that. And we indeed, unsurprisingly, observe this kind of transition in the flow stress curves. That is that uh, uh, low temperatures is a string hardening and gradually flow softening kicks in and becomes dominant at high temperatures. So up to now, what have we got? We have got materials data, right? So we're ready to kick in and do some state simulation. So we very much at this part of my talk, I finished the materials modeling side, and I'm going to show you some uh, case studies that is linking materials modeling with processing simulation. And uh, I will show three case studies. The first case study is on a casting simulation. And uh, it studies the effect of composition variation on simulation results. As we know that uh, for each alloy, the alloy using as an example here is an aluminum alloy, A319. For each alloy, it has a specification range, which basically means when you get your alloy, you don't necessarily know the composition of it, or uh, it can be of a wider range. So in this study, it studies the variation in silicon, copper, and zinc. And the different alloy composition will give you different properties. As you can see here, there will be a different in the fraction solid curve during solidification. Mind you, this is a cooling down process, so looking at it this way. And you will also uh, see the difference in the calculated uh, physical, pro physical properties, like here is a density as an example. So this kind of different properties would mean that if you input those material data in your simulation software, you will have different simulation results. And here, I'm going to show you some of them. The top one is a calculated hotspots. And you can see these are low spec, average, and high spec. You will have a different uh, simulation results. And the, the one below is a feeding porosity for these three uh, alloys. And for different spec, you can see you will have a different uh, forms of defects. I mean, for those doing casting simulation, you probably can get more information from this kind of similar results than from me, than from me because I'm no casting simulation expert. So that is the thing on casting simulation. Uh, I'd, also, I'd also like to present a case study on forming simulation. Uh, this is a hot stamping simulation, and uh, we are using a V-bending test 
as an experimental technique. And uh, the steel of interest is a uh, 22 mongris boron 5. And it is a, a advanced high strength steel that used in car industry a lot. And it contains a few critical steps. That is you heat at the furnace, transport to press, and you do the forming stage, and then quenching, and then unloading. That is essentially how this process is modeled. It considers in terms of uh, processing, furnace, transfer, sampling plus quenching, and spring back. In terms of stimulation, different stages, you can uh, either uh, simulate heat transfer, or you can simulate heat transfer deformation and be the uh, consideration of uh, transmission, uh, or you can just simulate deformation. And the materials data used in such kinds of simulation includes phase transmission kinetics. I use TTT as an example here. And uh, it, then it then also needs information per phase. Uh, here, I use the molar volume uh, of austenite, fireite, martensite, and bainite as an example. Of course, you can get all these kind of uh, property per phase information for other properties like uh, thermoconductivity, so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of uh, mechanical properties, it requires flow stress curves. And here I showed two examples. One is a flow stress curves of austenite, and the other is of ferrite. They are at different temperatures for a fixed uh, strain rate. And in reality, you would need this kind of curves for a wide temperature range as well as a strain rate range. Put everything together, and I'm going to show you this is, in fact, the only one animation picture in my entire talk. That is a simulation of the forming stage. It shows a geometry change and also the change in temperature fields. In the end, the, the ultimate uh, important stuff is the final result, the final component. And it compares the experimental with simulation. Uh, this is, the, in fact, is the effect of the spring back. And uh, experimental data is 60 to 61.5, and the simulation gives a 60 to uh, 62. Degree, uh, degree. So this is a rather good uh, com uh, comparison, uh, rather good agreement. So the last case study I'd like to show you is, uh, is an additive manufacturing or AM related simulation because the simulation itself is not on the additive manufacturing process. If in fact to study the effect of post heat treatment on residue stresses of uh, AM produced parts, and the components is a bearing bracket and it's made of uh, titanium 64. And here is a post heat treatment or say temperature time profile of that process. And uh, so this is temperature and this is the time, temperature time profile. It studies the whole effect of this treatment on the residual stress fields. And for this one, Apart from the material data, such as physical and thermal physical properties and the flow stress curves as a function of temperature and the strain rates, as I shown here, it also needs uh, creep data. Or it needs uh, to be precise, it needs a secondary creep rate data. And that's why, indeed, when we carried out this uh, benchmark study, uh, we have to manually provide this kind of data so that they can try. And uh, it's provided uh, in this form that is quick rate or uh, quick data or secondary quick rate as a function of temperature and stress in this kind of tabulated form. Uh, the purpose of this study, right, is in fact is a, a benchmark. And uh, they want to study uh, whether they can use calculated material data, including creep data replace their uh, experimental data or their, the, or their library data. And because for 6.4, as you know, it is a workhorse of titanium alloys. So that's the most popular one. And there are lots of uh, material data available on all the aspects. And uh, if you, but if you want to do this kind of solution for other alloys, you may not be that lucky because you may only have limited or 
or no data at all for those kind of alloys. So they are trying to understand whether using a calculated material data can match uh, the simulation from uh, experimental data or their library data. And in the end, they are, this, uh, this is a simulation result from the library data, and uh, this is a simulation result uh, from uh, calculated data. As you can see, there's not much difference in these two, so which is brilliant. That basically means that uh, if you have some alloys that you have a little data available, then comp uh, computer modeling or materials data calculated, uh, calculation is indeed a way forward. So now I come to the concluding remarks part of the talk. And uh, I hope that in the last uh, uh, 40 minutes or so that I have introduced something uh, that may interest you. And looking back on this processing simulation, right? In the past, it is like uh, you got material data mainly from experimental testing. And uh, you put that into a simulation package, you get your simulation result. That will happen in the past usually. And uh, currently, the material data can be calculated for some existing alloys. And such calculate data can be linked with processing simulation packages to achieve your simulation results. And of course, if what I'm trying to say is that in future, we are look, when we talk about a real virtual simulation, it will be like using materials modeling to calculate materials data of new systems, of new alloys. And by linking such calculated data with your simulation packages, that you can get your virtual simulation result. This is the, the truly virtual because uh, we are very much moving away from the physical testing part of the, uh, of the view. Whether that uh, is the near future or long future, but that is uh, depending on how hard you and or we working on. There are another two important things coming out of uh, such exercise of linking materials modeling with processing simulation. That is, we are rather face a nice dilemma here because before materials modeling, there's a lack of material data. And now with materials modeling, we may have too many material data, too many for the CE package to handle. Let's just use a simple example that uh, many CE, pa uh, CE packages usually uh, to deal with the property as a function of temperature, but they don't consider whether it is a, during a heating process or during a cooling process. It can only handle one set of temperature dependence. But of course, with the possibility of materials modeling to calculate such kind of data for different processes. So it may be time, uh, it certainly push the CE packages to further consider how they are they can improve the dealing of such process in their uh, uh, simulation side. So another thing is, uh, again, is uh, at the moment, right, the materials modeling or calculation of material data uh, very much happens outside of the CE simulation. The ideal scenario, of course, would be to have this kind of materials models built or embedded in the CE package. Then there you can, see you will achieve a seamlessly, a smooth uh, process and simulation. But these are, of course, for future considerations. And uh, again, just our current status, uh, I mentioned a few processing techniques at the start, and I can, I'm happy to say that lots of those things can already be achieved by this kind of uh, linkage between modules modeling and processing simulation, from casting to heat treatment, to forging, to welding, and uh, rolling, and uh, 3D printing. Uh, this is very much the end of my talk, and I have to thank many people around, including those uh, uh, our team members and other collaborators. Without them, then we wouldn't see uh, the work today. And uh, also many thanks to Dr. Parak Prakash and uh, Kwang Su uh, for inviting me to uh, into this circle. And, uh, and the final thank you is, of course, to the audience. Yeah, th thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And um, 
Um, already your uh, Jamie Pro model has a uh, well developed and many people use your uh, program. Anyway, I want to know about the AI technology when, because uh, in these days, um, the A AI technology is uh, um, applied to many uh, areas. And, and, and also uh, in your uh, Jamie Pro software, uh, that is only used the uh, physical model. But I yeah. want to know <laughs> your opinion on combining AI technology with your physical model. Uh, that is uh, certainly a possibility. Yes, I, as you kindly, uh, you rightly said that AI is a very popular tool. And uh, at the moment, uh, I mean, for our side, uh, uh, we are mainly, as you know, developing physical models. That is, uh, we try to develop models of some kind of physical nature. Yeah, I'm not saying that empirical wouldn't come in, but uh, we but we try to develop model you know, of a physical nature. It is also in this context uh, that uh, at least in the short term future, we have no plan of uh, combining AI kind of modeling into our uh, uh, materials modeling approach. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, if, if I can quickly ask a question, you, you mentioned that you don't have an ambition to include AI based data. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering actually if you look at the different um, databases that are out there, obviously there is a problem with compatibility. Also, if you import different data sets from, from say different companies on similar steel compositions. Um, but what is your mechanism in order to scrutinize these data sets? Or are you looking at developing data sets for, for very specific applications? Uh, from our side, right. Uh, I didn't say any model assessment or validation in this talk because that will be another long story. For in our uh, current model approach, there are lots of data coming in, but those data are all experimental data. Put it this way, if there are other data coming from AI approach, we would not consider that because purely because of you know, the, uh, the uncertainty involved in those data. So in our current model assessment, uh, our data are mainly from uh, uh, those um, handbooks or the index data from our users. These are the main sources. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Jen. Now I ask a question, right? Yeah. So uh, now you have mechanic property prediction in your model. And then uh, uh, you also see mere casting wearing process. But in most of these kind of cast or wearing products, those properties mainly depends on the defects. Where are the defects? And you mentioned the hotspot. Hotspot is one of them, the kind of processes and then cracks, uh, internal stress. Those play a significant role uh, in terms of mechanic property prediction. Mm. Uh, do you have a plan to include those one? Uh, or you say that's probably for delicate software uh, to <laughs> complications? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Dong. That's a very good question. Uh, but indeed, it's a little bit out of the sc scope of us, because at the moment, right, uh, dealing with defects is still very much uh, the work or the job of those uh, CE packages. And the current uh, materials modeling is mainly to provide uh, this kind of uh, property data for them to carry out uh, their CE simulation. And I believe each uh, let's say casting simulation package, they will have their own uh, methods and uh, they, will, they will have their own techniques in, in, in dealing with those, uh, how to ju judge a defect, how to judge uh, the possibility of forming defect. Uh, I'm afraid that is an area that I'm not entirely familiar with. And I think, uh, as you said, it, it, it probably needs those kind of delicate C packages to deal with this side of story. Okay, thank you. 
Um, it's only it's, uh, it's uh, Didier Farogian here. How are you? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask you. Um, uh, obviously, you described very, very well the the, the transition from a creep to uh, a sigma epsilon uh, uh, curve for the modeling the material flow stress. But in, in reality, life is a bit more complex in terms of plugging or making sure that the macrostructure is acting uh, uh, also on, the, on on sigma epsilon. If you want to, for instance, um, be accurate in, in modeling um, dynamic recovery and uh, critical strains and dynamic recrystallizations, for instance. So in GEMAT Pro, is there any sort of a attempt or or, or movement to uh, maybe include uh, much more complex laws um, uh, to be able to uh, to predict these or, or account uh, for this in 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 flow stress uh, uh, calculations or prediction? Uh, yes, we are thinking about uh, having uh, maybe some localization based models uh, in this kind of situation. As you said, uh, that's, that's very true. And to do this kind of uh, uh, conversion from one set of curves, let's say quick curve to stress strain curves, that is a very big assumption. And uh, one of the assumptions, and I didn't mention today I, because that's really deep, uh, long story, will be assumed the, con the microstructure to remain constant or That's relatively right. unchanged, or relatively unchanged. And in reality, this works for many places, or at least this will be, uh, this would give close enough results as we found out in many of the systems. But if there are cases where microstructure changes a lot or grain size changes a lot, then of course we will have rather different results or different uh, stress strain curves. Uh, we realize this fact, uh, this uh, thing, that this uh, kind of uh, thing can happen. But unfortunately, we do not have a solution for that yet. Because uh, recently I did look at uh, this uh, uh, superplastic forming. That is one area. The other area is uh, translation induced uh, transformation, where transformation will take place during this, uh, your tensile testing or your during that kind of test. And I'm afraid as a moment, we, we thought about that, but uh, those kind of modeling or to build a translation model inside the current uh, setup of uh, stress strain curve model is not an easy task. No. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank that's, you. That's, a, that's a brilliant question, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jackie, I think. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jesse Tom from WMG. So I got a question. So uh, uh, you said that the uh, GMAT Pro is based on uh, the data from the experiments. Uh, I'm wondering if there is a way to trace back where the data come from. So in that way, if we are struggling with the uh, data, then we can go back to the paper or, or literature to see uh, what's the starting max structure, uh, what's the uh, ex experimental uh, conditions. I remember in some calc when do the simulation, we can see the references. It it it, it uh, yes. I'm I'm wondering could GMAT Pro also show us the references? It's when do when we are doing the modeling. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, the experimental data uh, comes in the model assessment part of the story, and uh, uh, that's why uh, we. Right, uh, we write many reports along the way and we publish a few things in the public domain. And, uh, but to implement those kind of data points, experimental data points in, uh, in the calculation plot is, is not a straightforward. Uh, I know that you mentioned SMOCAC and they do that, but a SMOCAC uh, can do that purely because uh, they are so far, shall I say, still focus on thermodynamic calculations. And in that way, um, it's, it's probably easier to do if, you're, if your interest is mainly like a, a, a liquidus or solidus, uh, that's probably uh, easier to do. And uh, the other thing is uh, comes in the, as I explained a little bit, that is uh, for each alloy, right? For each alloy, you tend to have a composition range. And uh, depending on the composition, whether it's a low spec average or high spec, 
you may have very different results. This is also in that sense, it's not always straightforward to put experimental data points in your calculation plot. Let's say if you calculate for a different alloy of a slightly mm -hmm. different condition, what should we do? What should we do? Because you certainly cannot put the experimental data of an alloy of known different condition in it, that calculation plot. Yes, I, I think your point. Yeah, your point that is kind of extrapolation from the previous data. What I'm what I'm saying that uh, can we know the references you based? So we know that it based on this composition, this experiment that we extrapolate that uh, result we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those can 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 be traced back to the uh, to the model assessment. Where if you are interested, in, I can send you the this kind of report. Okay. Where you can trace back to the references. Okay. Sorry if I misunderstood. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks.